after watching this and discovering this and learning a little bit more about free diving, do you think you, that would be something you'd ever be interested in in trying? <laughs> They're laughing. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know you thought it too. <laughs> well, before I ask, before I answer that question, what about you? Would you try it? Oh hell no. <laughs> <laughs> No, I can't. This is the thing about me and water. I don't like being in any body of water where my feet can't touch the bottom, so there will be no ocean for me. And I can only swim on my back. Like, there's something about me swimming with my face in the water that freaks me out. I can only do backstrokes. It's really weird. I don't know what that's about. There used to be an ad on TV. I don't know if you guys had it over here. It was this cowboy or something. He said he doesn't go in water that's deeper than his bath, and he doesn't go any higher than his horse's back. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, I don't know what that ad was for, but um, me either. <laughs> but yeah, you might be a bit like him. Um, <laughs> I'm worse than him, actually. So, self admittedly. But how about you? Uh, yeah, I I swim in Ireland uh, all year round, and it's pretty nippy, and it gives me a good jolt uh, in the morning time. Um, and so I'd be pretty comfortable in the water. So I gave it a little go um, in in uh, the Blue Hole in in um, in the Bahamas. Um, and I, I got down to three meters. Oh, wow. Uh, which isn't very far, obviously. But it the uh, the pressure was the pressure on my ears that so made me So talk to me about that, since you've actually done it. Oh, come on so now. I'm not one to solve No, no, about no. Like but but from, from, from a layman person's experience, because yeah. we all want to know. We want to know, right? So, so from a layman person's experience that's actually done it and gotten down to three meters, talk to me about what that feels like, because it looks on screen it looks effortless. It doesn't look like there's any pressure. You hear them talking about the pressure, but it doesn't look that way. Yeah. So from somebody who's actually done a little bit of it, tell us how that was. So there's there's the thing that stops everybody going down further than a couple of meters really is is the pressure on your ears more so. And you have to, you know, if you're on a plane, you kind of have to hold your nose and push out. You have to continue doing that as a free diver all the way down. Like you continue getting this pressure and you have to push the air out. And so if I, I don't know how to equalize and I'm not great at holding my nose and, you know, doing that. Um, so it was that I, I loved it. I was pulling the rope going down and I absolutely loved it. But but really quickly, that pressure went on my ears and I just had to, it's really sore. I just have to turn around and come back up. But um, I had just been watching people go to 100 meters. So I was probably <laughs> a bit foolhardy, like I probably shouldn't have been even <laughs> giving it a go. But I was surrounded by like a whole load of safety divers. So I knew I was pretty OK. OK. OK, Laura, I am impressed. I am impressed. You know Good the on three you. Three meters is like that. It's nothing like. Listen, I don't care. You did it. <laughs> what matters is that you did it. That's a huge accomplishment. Most people wouldn't do it. Most people wouldn't try. Most people would be like, "Oh, that's dangerous." Yeah, I'm not trying to do all that. <laughs> and how did you establish um, trust with your contributors and subjects for this film? Because it's very sensitive. You know, I suppose my my dad. Um, you know, died a couple of years beforehand, and and I suppose I I kind of like got, you know, my dad qu died quite young, and and I kind of got like that loss of someone who who wasn't supposed to die yet, and and I I I, I, I could resonate with the the pain that they were going through, and and I just was, yeah, it was just important to me that I uh, took it really slowly and was led by them, you know. And um, and a lot of Peter or Stephen also saved a lot of people's lives. So a lot of other people, the people were queuing up to to kind of pay tribute to Stephen. That's amazing. Um, free diving is such a beautiful, beautiful, um, intense, extreme sport to watch. It feels so weird to call it an intense, extreme sport, but it kind of is because you're holding your breath for such a long time and you're in such a large body of water where your feet can't touch the ground, which I can totally relate to because that is why that's I will intense. never be in an ocean. <laughs> but um, having said that, I wanted to talk to you about how you collaborated with your DP, Tim Craig, to accomplish some of those shots and how much of it was archival footage and how much of it was uh, footage that you guys shot um, in real time. So Tim shot a lot of, Tim shot all the interviews, um, or most of them, um, and then we collaborated with an amazing freediving cinematographer Julie Gautier, so she holds her breath, goes down with the diver, and, and shoots at the same time. And, and the reason why she has to be on breath hold is because scuba divers, as you may have learned in the film, can't go up and down at speed. 
Um, and, and so that was incredible. Like we had a, a, as a filmmaker to have like this wealth of archive, which, you know, was shocking that like so much of this existed. You know, we would, we knew the story we wanted to tell. We were like, what exists out there? And sometimes we just have one photo from it from a, a moment and but we'd see that somebody in the background is that a camera is it a phone is it what is it and then we'd find out it's camera then who is it that's Stefano and does anybody know how to get in touch with Stefano okay great and and Stefano would say okay I'll have a look I'll see if I uh, if that hard drive is still in my attic and and it turned out Stefano had 500 gigabytes of footage from around that time with Alessia and that just kept happening over and over again. Like every time we went out, like we put the tentacles out all over the world, um, all over the all over the globe, and 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 more often than not, it existed somewhere. And it was in the middle of COVID as well, so people had the time to go up into the attic, find the hard drive, go through <laughs> numerous hard drives, maybe to find it. Um, and so, but then we also had the opportunity to go and film in the Blue Hole in Dahab in uh, Long Island, Bahamas, uh, at Vertical Blue, and also um, in Mexico. So we filmed in a cenote in Mexico, some of the later stuff in the films from that. And then we also filmed in the Caribbean Sea off Mexico as well. I actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I actually was gonna ask you about that because you did shoot during COVID. So was it difficult to get access to all those different locations during that time? Yeah, it was difficult to get access to the Blue Hole. I think it can be tricky uh, at the best of times. Um, but with COVID, it was extra tricky. And our our team just like worked tirelessly. There was lots of different hoops that they had to j jump through, um, even just to film there. And they were, it, they yeah, it, it took an awful lot of, a lot of kind of behind the scenes stuff. And also, 16, we've 16 contributors and they're from 10 different countries. So that's a challenge in itself and then add COVID to it and you've got things like quarantine and stuff. It was just next to impossible. Like we thought like this is not possible to do, make this film in, in this age and uh, wow. And we, we found like a number of different, we had to just delay, but we found like, okay, there's gonna be four people in Sharm El Sheikh you know, this week we'll go there. Okay, there's gonna be nine people at Vertical Blue, we'll go there. So we kind of like, um, we just had to be patient. Wow, how long did it take to accomplish shooting all this? Because it was so intricate. All of it was so incredibly intricate between you having to compile all the archival footage, which you were really lucky to get as much of it as you did, and having to shoot in all those different locations. How long would you say it took you to compile it and get into an editing session? You know, we were still compiling archive and still shooting well into the edit because it was such a big story. So it, it took two years, which isn't like from started production, but I had been kind of working away on it for two years, not really full time though, before that. Um, but two years in production, 11 months in the edit, and like with the some of the reconstructed material, we would we had all the interviews down, had all the archive down, and we storyboarded exactly like which shots, because there were only small little gaps that we needed to, to fill in, and uh, yeah, we storyboarded each one. This was quite late in the edit and oh, when we shot those. Speaking of storyboarding, you have all that archival footage, you have the new interviews that you did, you have the footage, the new footage that you shot in the blue hole and everything. How did you go about, put, it's like putting a puzzle together. So how did you decide what interviews to use, what interviews you couldn't use? You know, how did you decide to put it all together? So uh, before we shot any of the interviews, I did long and recorded Zooms, or uh, the interviews on Zoom, mm -hmm. so research interviews. Mm -hmm. and, and I was able to figure out what everybody was, you know, okay, to plan the interviews, um, I suppose. Um, and so we actually used every interview that we shot. Um, oh. We shot 16 interviews, we used 16 interviews because we had the time because of COVID where we could really prep who was going to address which piece of the story. Because, you know, you've got Alessia's childhood, Alessia's, you know, the, the pool, the sea, 
Dahab, you've got Stephen's childhood, you've got his travels in Africa. You've, there's a lot of moments where like only one person can speak to like this one piece, and it was about trying to figure out who can speak to this piece. Okay, but they can also speak to this, and it was a total puzzle. Like you should have seen my attic had like <laughs> strings going across every which way, <laughs> cards, you know, pictures of people. Like it was like a mad person's attic. Um, but that's kind of what it took uh, to to kind of get it all to fit together. So it was kind of looking like a forensic files office, huh? Yeah. <laughs> that is hilarious. I also wanted to talk to you. I was. I'm watching and I was riveted. I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm thinking it's gonna turn out a different way. I'm thinking that Alessia is the person that perished. And then we discover that Alessia is not the person that perished, but the person that survived only when you put the camera on her. What made you, to, what made you decide to have the reveal done that particular way? Yeah, it's a really good question. I suppose um, one of the things I will say is that like it's such an incredible story, but I wish it wasn't true. You know, um, I remember seeing it in this in this big on the big screen for the first time, and trying to picture other people watching it and what they might think is going to happen after they see Al Alessia. And I thought, God, you know, there is a world where Stephen might have, you know, yeah, we there is a world where if what happened didn't happen where Stephen could come in here now and we realize that everybody's okay and wouldn't that be such a better film um, uh, and a better outcome, obviously. Um, but I suppose, yeah, just an answer to your question. Um, when I met with Peter, Stephen's dad, he, uh, uh, after our first coffee, he, he gave me a pen drive, put it across the table, one of the small ones. And he said, oh, there's, about, there's a couple of interviews of Stephen on that. Hmm. And I listened, I, I went home, put it into my computer, and there was like 13 hours of audio interview with Stephen. Uh, Peter's, Peter had asked his best friend, who was a radio producer, he said, oh, Stephen's always coming home telling me these great stories. They're, they're really good stories, you know, you should probably record them. And Michal, who, who did that, came along and did one interview and then did another one and ended up coming, coming back like 12 or, 12 or 13 times to, to interview Stephen. And, and I suppose when I... As a filmmaker, you know that there's certain elements that require, you know, access to. And obviously we, you know, we're never going to get to speak to Stephen, sadly. But here we're first Stephen speaking firsthand about his life. And that's when I thought, God, well, if we've Stephen talking about his life, perhaps if all these other elements come to us over time, perhaps we can tell the story in the moment, in the present tense, not retrospectively looking back you know with hindsight as to okay this person has passed away and here's how it happened um i thought because of the nature of the story wouldn't it be amazing for the audience to go on the journey with stephen and alessia um everybody not knowing on you know not knowing what was to come um and and so that's Treating Stephen and Alessia in the same way was how that would be possible, you know, because if we had Alessia on camera at the very start and not Stephen, you know, everybody would just be busy in their heads putting two and two together. Mm -hmm. So we we Stephen's uh, interviews and we had his archive that he shot himself and tons of other archive, and then we used Alessia's audio as their lives are kind of coming together, that's how we see both of them. And then they're together on screen and it's just wonderful. You know that like something kind of amazing is gonna happen when they do meet. But then uh, sadly, after the accident, when their lives diverge again, it felt like that was the time to treat them differently. And that was the time to see Alessia on screen. And it was really important to me that that moment we just pause with her for that moment and and get to really witness the pain that she was feeling, the survivor's guilt, the huge arc that she had just come on, you know, this huge journey that's left her, you know, absolutely heartbroken um, and devastated and this, this awful thing now that she has to carry for her whole life. Um, so that, long story short, is, yeah, is the thinking behind it. That's beautiful how, how you explained getting that together because I, I seriously was very, very curious about that. In watching The Deepest Breath, it's more than just a story about these two freedivers 
doing free diving. It's about these two souls that connected in a way that most people don't have an opportunity to connect. They, they ended up being each other's soulmate. Would you agree with that or would you disagree with that? I suppose like, um, although I knew the end of the story, I knew the story, I could, when I went back and I was really like looking at their lives, I, I saw this like call and response between the two of their lives. You know, one would have too much of something, but the other one would be lacking in it or, and vice versa. And, and, and when they come together and you see them at Vertical Blue, like you can just see that there's, without words, like most of it's underwater, you can just see that there's, there's really like a connection there. Um, so yeah, I would I would definitely have said that they were they were you know each other's missing piece. Yeah. You know. Since Stephen's death, as we saw in the film, Alessia has garnered 23 world records in the pool in the sea, and he would tell her to live and be happy. Would you say that that is the biggest takeaway for this film to live in the moment and not dwell on the past? 100%, and that's why we structured it the way we did as well, you know, because it didn't feel like we should tell Stephen's story in a way which was, you know, um, hindsight and here, here's, here's something that you shouldn't do. You know, it was really, like, um, important to be in the moment. Um, and, yeah, definitely, Alessia has, has held on to that message from Stephen. Um, and that 23 is already out of date um, because she recently, about three weeks ago, went to 123 meters in this discipline. So she's added 19 meters onto her onto the world record since the end of this film. So she's just an adrenaline junkie. No, wow. not at all, not at all. This is the thing with the sport. It's like, you have to be the opposite to an adrenaline junkie. You have to kind of be like a, a monk, you know? Mm. You're, you're like super chilled, super zen. Uh, you know, your heart rate lowers. To, to like half its normal rate. Um, and yeah, it's quite the opposite. She's an incredible athlete, yeah. Have you, ha have you had an opportunity to uh, touch base with her since doing the film? You uh, guys are close, yeah? A lot, yeah, a lot. I, I chat to her, I just send her updates like as to what we're doing and what, what audiences are saying. <laughs> and you know, she's, um, this isn't really her, her vibe to come along and, and kind of be in the light and have people kind of looking at her but she loves to hear about what people are saying to me afterwards and so I'll, I'll fill her in um, and uh, myself and John and Sarah who were uh, two of the producers we um, God it feels like ages ago now about a year ago more actually um, we went over to Rome to show her the film when it was almost finished and we showed it to Peter earlier on in the week and uh, we went over to show it to Alessia her dad Enzo and her boyfriend and um, we sat down with her in, in the house and, um, you know, afterwards she took a minute and, and then she said, like, thank you. And she thought it was a really fair representation of the story. And, and then a couple of days later, she asked to if she could have a copy so that she could show, like, like friends of hers and coaches um, just so that she didn't have to do all the explaining that here was a way that they could understand what she went through without her having to sit and tell them the whole story. And for me as a filmmaker, like I, like Alessi had given so much to the film and I was just like, I was just so glad that on, a le on some level she would be able to get something back from it. And the fact that she, c she felt like she could meant an awful lot to me, you know, as a filmmaker. Well, I think that I could speak for everybody in the theater today and everybody that screened it, for you to go back and report to Alessia that this was an amazing portrayal of a snapshot in her life that lasted for a few years, but now it's gonna last for an eternity. And it's a beautiful snapshot at that. And we thank you so much for uh, allowing us to see it and bringing it to us. Let's give a hand to Laura McCann, the director of The Deepest Breath. Thank you. Thank you.